Let me start by talking about uh, Cabral and how this book came about. Two or three years ago, I, I visited for the first time in my life uh, Guinea-Bissau, and I asked them, people were hosting me, I would like to pay tribute to Amilcar Cabral. I'd like to visit his mausoleum. I had to write, write uh, a letter uh, of application uh, a couple of weeks beforehand. Uh, and the reason was that, that Cabral's mausoleum is in the middle, or rather at right the back of, the military headquarters in Guinea-Bissau. March through the, the military camp, all the way to the back, and there is the mausoleum, with his words, Amilcar Cabral, and then along the side, smaller, plates of other revolutionary leaders of PRGC. And then as I left, you know, it, it occurred to me that what the military, military in a sense were more afraid of Cabral dead than alive. Um, and maybe that they recognize that memorials are more about the future than about the past. Because the struggle of memory <coughs> against forgetting is something that is really, really critical. And I think you know, here I am in Kenya. Uh, if, if there is a nation that should be honored for amnesia, it is perhaps this one here. Uh, and, and I think this is one of the, the motive forces behind my saying, OK, we, we have to bring together a, an anthology of contributions on, uh, on this remarkable individual. A, a profound, profound uh, writer. I mean, he's up there with the, uh, with the Fanons, the Rodneys, the Bicos, the, the um, Sankaras. There's a preconception held by many people even on the left, that imperialism made us enter history at the moment it began its adventures in our countries. We consider that when imperialism arrived in Guinea, it made us leave history. The moment imperialism arrived and colonialism arrived, it made us leave our history and enter another history. Culture, he said, is an essential element of the history of a people. Culture is perhaps the product of this history, just as a flower is the product of a plant. Like history, or because it is history, culture has its material base, the level of the productive forces, and the mode of production. I mean, that was quite revolutionary. I didn't realize what a huge impact Cabral had on the black liberation movement in North America. The, the, the influence was enormous. It was internationally was enormous. And, and I had always seen him as being influential, as a founder of the PIGC, the liberation movement in Guinea-Bissau, the founder of the MPLA in Angola, the founder of Frelimo in, in Mozambique. I had not understood, really, his incredible uh, influence and uh, on the thinking of people uh, across the world. This this book um, was is was was a was a was an act of love. It was an act of commitment to the ideals of Pan Africanism and saying we must resuscitate. We must make sure that we create the memories that are relevant, but also have the courage to invent the future. And that brings me to, to the other one. Cabral was actually killed by his own comrades. Okay? He, they walked into his office early in the morning and one person shot him in the belly. He collapsed, he, he leaned over, and what were his last words? He said, Comrade, this is no way to resolve disputes. They then emptied God knows how many shots into his body. And one of the things we do is to blame people outside. 
And we have to take ownership of our own complicity and the complicity of the people who form part of our own societies. Because until we do so, we cannot move forward. And another person who was killed by his own was Ken Sarawiwa. Ken Sarawiwa was a poet, a writer, an activist. He was a member of uh, the Ogoni people in Nigeria, where Shell had been exploiting oil and tearing the environment. Shell eventually paid out of court settlement $15 million. But even that doesn't compensate for half of what happened at my time. He was a brilliant, he spoke on behalf of his own people. He was the leading member of Mossop, the uh, movement for the uh, um, uh, for the survival, not just the liberation of, but the survival of the Ogoni people. He led a non-violent campaign against environmental destruction by operations by the multinational corporations. He had formed a friendship with an Irish nun, Sister uh, Magella McCarran, to whom he wrote regularly. Unfortunately, we don't have copies of her letters to him because the military had disposed of things. But she kept all the letters that he wrote. These letters and poems are invaluable fragments of a living conversation that portrays the indomitable power in humans to stay alive in the face of certain death and to stay alive even <coughs> in death. He wrote these letters on a regular, he, he smuggled them out in food baskets and so on uh, and when he was moved into prison he continued writing. This book contains his last writings, letters which are inspirational of somebody who is not concerned about his personal fate but the fate of his people. And uh, he knew he was facing certain death. And sure enough, his last letter, he knew exactly what was happening. Because the next morning, they grabbed him and eight of his comrades and hanged them. This was the Abacha regime. There was huge international outcry against this. But you know, he's been forgotten. Another one of the many heroes we have who has been forgotten. So my commitment. What happened was that uh, Maj Sister Magella wrote to the uh, National University of Ireland in Maynooth and said, I want to donate all these letters to the library. And I knew somebody at the library who immediately wrote to me saying, please Rose, would you publish these? <laughs> And so we agreed to do so, together with uh, about 49 of his, his poems. Keep out of prison, he wrote. Don't get arrested anymore. But while the land is ravaged and our pure air is poisoned, with the streams choke, choked with pollution, silence would be treason. Where are our Kensarawiwas? Where are the birds? Thank you. And I'm also recognizing that I'm here because so many people have died before me for this freedom. So I, I, I recognize that. One of them is Cabral, but there are many others. There are many ancestors of this land. There are many people in this room who've come a long way and done a lot of things. So I'll begin by uh, just a little quote from Cabral. In one of his lectures, he stated, struggle is a daily action against ourselves and against the enemy. So the first le important lesson that I learned through all of these contradictions, not in any, these are not scheduled in any importance, but just how I'm presenting to you, is cross-class movement building. And that's very important because I find that many people who fit into my demographic, which is, over-educated, bourgeois, middle-class, over-educated, very, feel very... Thank you. 
unable to connect with people who are not of their class, and this is a problem. And I want to emphasize the importance of cross-class movement building because sometimes uh, intellectuals, so-called intellectuals and so-called middle class, think that they know better than everyone else. He said that um, the only ideology you need really is an ideology that will bring about material goods for your people. And so connecting theory and practice, uh, recognizing that theory needs to include epistemic and experiential openness. So recognizing that people come from different places, bring many things, bring many experiences that are really all valuable in this means and work towards liberation and transforming self and society. So just once again emphasizing connecting theory and practice. Another lesson is remembering and regarding and always remembering the importance of women. And I, I, it's not that I need Cabral to tell me this, that we need to recognize women as important, but it, it really resonated uh, with me all the work, the, the, really the, how women were held as important in, in, in uh, Guinea-Bissau, in Capo Verde, in all the struggles for liberation. In, in village councils, in, uh, throughout the struggle with the PAGC and beyond, women were always important uh, and Cabral always emphasizes. Connecting with the deepest aspirations of the masses and not betraying our mission, like Fanon said. Often we relegate culture to a peripheral position because we think, oh, intellectuals, or this is primitive or this is whatever, but culture is a very important front and is often the first front from which people fight for their own liberation and fight against social, political, and economic injustice. So with regard to returning to the source, Cabral also says we must deny the pre pretended supremacy of the culture that seeks to dominate us. Cabral was down to fight for people's liberation, not just in Guinea-Bissau, not just in Capo Verde, but throughout the African world and had a very strong internationalist perspective. So recognizing this, again, is a re-emphasis that we, until, or we're all free, no one is free. So just working with that always in our mind. And just one more lesson, um, and that I think about being home in Kenya now after some time away is claiming no easy victories. And sometimes I find that in Kenya, Correct me if I'm wrong because I've been absent and so maybe have no right to say these things. But sometimes I feel that we take our constitution to as, as heralding something great, which it does, but in some ways it's, we may be claiming an easy victory because there's still a lot of work to be done and there's still a lot of implementation to be done. We struggle against ourselves, as Cabral said, and against our enemies. And in this work, we must also do, and I'm, I'm almost done here, as Cabral advised to a group of Africans organizing in America, part of who are part of the Black Liberation Movement, he said, and he was talking metaphorically, he said, if a thief comes into your house, you shoot the body and not the shadow. And what he was saying by this is that we must really target the ills in our society. We must really target the roots of what uh, afflict us. And Fanon said something similar when he said, we need to really step in the open wounds. We really need to probe and, and really look at uh, the open wounds of all that afflicts us. So if we really want no masters, no slaves, and if we really want to deal with the overseers within us, if we really want to work for justice, we must remember to be precise and we must also be grateful and take courage from the people who walked before us. And that's my contribution in that book is taking courage from a lot of people who've walked before us, including Makatilili Wamenza, including Piogama Pinto, including Bildad Kagia, including Sarah Bartman, including all of these people who struggled before us. And in doing this, we must be ready to struggle for against ourselves and against the enemy, but also remember to shoot the body and not the shadow, because we cannot afford to miss. In those terribly dark, reversive, bad days, 
They are some of my most fulfilling days. For one, it was the first time I felt wholly and truly Kenyan. It did not matter whether I was an Asian, I was a woman, I came from the coast. I was part of a small group, a very small group. But we knew that many, many more such groups were committed to our vision of overthrowing the dictatorship. We were part of a movement. We shared and we cared. We had to care. Because our lives and our security depended on our comrades. We did so much. We read and studied theory, and the poetry and writings of Amilcar Cabral were one of the most widely read of the literary works of that time. In the bad 80s, we felt we were part of a national movement. And we were. Today, we do our thing in our cocoons, each separate from the other, often in competition. In the 38 chapters, two chapters particularly caught my attention, and Wanguri has talked a lot about them also. The one on women's emancipation and how the woman question has been demoted in the mission of national liberation. I cannot tell you the number of times I have been accused of being a bourgeois feminist or a Western feminist and dismissed. This seems to be no longer an issue because women today are busy trying to reform the system. Sadly, there is no women's movement which is challenging that system which is the root cause of women's oppression. The issue of race in the chapter on Pan-Africanism also interested me. The statement that just because one is black does not make one a Pan-Africanist or qualify one to be a freedom fighter. And from that follows of the vice versa argument. The basic cause of our dysfunctional society is the class divide. Yet I find that whenever I raise the issue in a workshop or a seminar, everyone applauds, of course. <laughs> and then we move on. <laughs> I think that we must reach out to the working class. However organized and united we may be, however potent we may become, our effectiveness will always be limited. Who was it who said, it is the economy, stupid? <laughs> Last December, after trying for almost six years, Zaid and I were able, together with the KHRC, to organize a Mackensen Memorial Lecture. Professor Lucien van der Walt, a South African labor rights practitioner and scholar, gave us a brilliant expose and we mounted a photographic exhibition of Martin Singh's life and the history of the trade union movement till 1952. So many shop stewards and others from the labor movement attended. Needless to say, Koto ignored the event totally. <laughs> All things being equal, we hope that this memorial lecture will become an annual event and that during the year many labor oriented projects will be attempted and that many of us will try and participate in them and perhaps even organize them. I haven't read the books so my comments really on Pan-Africanism 
uh, start with Shivji has already uh, said what Shivji has done uh, in terms of glorifying the work of Nyerere, you know, one of the great Pan-Africanists and, uh, uh, you know, making sure uh, that his, his mem memory lives. Uh, on the 18th of, of February this year, uh, Maina Kinyati lodged his book, um, sorry I couldn't make it to the launch, but in celebrating the, the date uh, Kimadi was hanged in 1957. This, this issue of his remains, uh, surely I always say that the British must know. Uh, the, the British um, British imperialism was very, very, very good at uh, keeping records. And uh, I also think that the Kenyan government, and I'm part of it now, uh, we are complicit in not, you know, finding out exactly where this, uh, you know, remains are. You know, the, the middle classes uh, in this country, particularly the professional groups, are very, 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 very ethnic. And I see it in the judiciary every, every, every day. The divisions on ethnicity and and and, and the region. So. There's a lot to be done. Um, you know, I, I guess those uh, activists who, who basically, and this is what I saw, I told uh, our, our comrade here. I said maybe uh, the judgment in March last year uh, gives you a dictatorship that you can make, you can organize against, or it be something. <laughs> <laughs> something that you can think about. There's another Pan-Africanist who died last uh, last year, Professor Namudere. What it says very, very, very clearly that what <coughs> collapsed uh, in 1989 when this Berlin War uh, collapsed wasn't wasn't socialism or or, or communism, and that <coughs> he said uh, there is need to find out what was the sense of, of, of those, all those governments, China, Albania, um, uh, Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. And he traced um, the collapse of, 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 of those regimes in a, in a way where uh, he was telling all of us that let's not be quick to condemn these paradigms of liberation. Uh, because they are the only uh, theoretical and ideological tools you have, you know, to critique neoliberalism, to uh, uh, critique imperialism. The movement itself uh, became like uh, a middle ground for, you know, a lot of us who uh, uh, felt that all was not lost and that there was a middle, uh, middle house or... or a middle position from which uh, you could criticize the the um, the old paradigms, but also you know the current one, which was uh, neoliberalism. And I think this that movement is growing, particularly after the 2008 uh, you know finance crisis in uh, in in in, uh, uh, in America. I I, I still. Remember what uh, Shibji tells those of us who want to retire from politics uh, or from struggles is that how can you retire when the struggle continues? Thank you very much. The people like Cabral, people like all those thinkers, Ho Chi Minh, meant a lot of, uh, gave us a sense of belonging to this world, to this continent and to Kenya. And, uh, and it's wonderful that now when many of us think that all is lost, we still are celebrating Cabral here, we are still talking about the Mau Mau Liberation Movement, we are still talking about more Kenya, we are still talking about December 12th Movement, and therefore I will not commit suicide tonight. We can only cease to be a revolutionary or to be in the struggle when you are in the casket. And even then, Mapambano, Yangali, Akendelea. So thank you very much, Davinda.
thank you very much all of you contributed to this book and of course can cancer Oriwa, those of us who are in canada in the 90s were part of that struggle for the ogoni people and the importance of connecting our struggles from the caribbean to latin america to africa different parts of africa i think if we if we we still are connected to that sense of internationalism and world citizenship this world will definitely be a better place on 18th was Kimavide. We have done a lot of mobilization. I was taken to court for protesting, many for like five charges. When I was sitting in the sitting in the board, listen to the charges, because the police had given us cash bill of ten thousand. So I thought the standard of the police would be transferred to the magistrate. Then uh, before I realized uh, the the mainstream NGO who are middle class and they think very backward. They had seen as a, a very hopeless lawyer who uh, I wish I had mentored her how to <laughs> protect our rights. <laughs> so she didn't speak. Before I realized the, the backward magistrate had imposed on us cash bill of 200,000. The law actually is very clear. It just says that uh, you should be um, released on bail or bond and the question is whether you attend trial okay that's the law so uh if, if you bring you know a pastor or somebody who uh confirms the court you attend trial uh, you, you should be you should be released but uh, i found that even that law is not uh, is not is not followed the magistrates like this uh huge cash bills for obvious reasons the moment you pay it uh, that's the end of of the case because the clerks will come to you and say but you know you have this deposit you know you just need to give us half of it and this you know this is the end of the case it's it's, it's, it's not easy to reform these institutions and to reform uh you know mindsets it's not it's not easy but um we're just looking for four pillars that we think we can, you know, uh, basically effect some change. Today, I'm really excited, and I'm first time in this kind of gathering, so I'm very lucky. I don't want to take much time, but let us keep that legacy on. And as I'm a peace ambassador also from United, from Universal Peace, and I always tell why peace is lacking. We are talking peace, peace, peace. And today I can learn and I can believe that the problem is like our brother Willis and everyone telling that I want to retire but I can't. And that is why I like that thing. That the problem today in the world is because of the silence of good people. One is uh, to emphasize on the need to bring uh, the issue of transitional justice on the grassroots as a process to document the contemporaries of the victims based on a researched and informed perspective uh, for, uh, for justice and uh, reflectional and uh, in, in post-conflict societies. There are so many atrocities that are still, uh, are still there that for, uh, can really form part of uh, such collections of uh, historical uh, documentations. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I just want to say something to our dear Chief Justice about the Wanjiko. Uh, the cost of justice is uh, so expensive in terms of the understanding that Wanjiko has down here. Uh, not so much knowledge uh, Wanjiko has about how to access justice. Uh, there's so many things that are, are going down here, but they are just go silenced. And the last thing I want to say is that the civil society people who are here. The name is changing from civil society to evil society because of your silence. We will have more. We are thinking about, uh, I mean, uh, we are coming towards this weekend to organize, we are coming up with the JM Karaoke Memorial, which we are collapsing also with Pinto, Pio Gama Pinto celebrations outdoor. And what we are saying is that uh, those spaces that are closing, we want to reopen them out in the outdoors.